So, all right, good afternoon and welcome to a special armchair history program. Um, when we first started doing these armchair histories in 2020, it was the lockdown, I'm sure you all remember, and we were doing them weekly to give people a way to educate and entertain themselves and still stay connected to um, the Southport community. Then last year, when things started to ease up, we started to do them monthly. And then today I was thinking about it, and I think this is the first one I've done this. I know it's the first one I've done this year. It may be the first one I've done since November. So I'm glad to be back. I hope you all are too. Um, Bob, is there a big gray box? No, there's no gray box. You're seeing, it, it looks good? Okay. Um, we have a spe couple of special guests with us today. Um, Joyce Pollock is, she is, is here. She is the daughter of Gary Potts one of the men who survived the sinking of the John D. Gill. And um, also, uh, and you'll be hearing more about him as I um, can do the program. And also Tish Hatem is with us today. She is the granddaughter of one of the volunteer nurses who cared for Mr. Potts. So you'll get a chance to ask them questions at the end. And if there's anyone else on the call who has family connections to this event or were at this event, um, please let us know. And as always, I want to give thanks to the Harper Library and to the Friends of the Library for helping us to spread the word about our programs. So, as everyone knows, um, U.S. involvement in World War II lasted approximately four years, from 1941 to 1945. Today, we're going to talk about the events of a single day in, Mar in March of 1942 which was only three months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So as we all know, on December 7th, 1941, 80 years ago, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Three days later, the US declared war on Japan. And the following day, December 11th, Germany declared war on the US and we responded by declaring war on Germany. So in a very few matter of days, and in there we also declared war on Italy. Very few days we were at war uh, in the world war. But what most people don't know is that just three months later, a Nazi U-boat torpedoed and sank an oil tanker right off the coast of Southport. Now, you might be thinking, that just seems so random. How, what are the odds that something like that would happen? Well, actually, the odds were pretty high. So this map here shows the locations of World War II shipwrecks off the North Carolina coast. There were so many submarine attacks off the North Carolina shore that the waters earned their own nickname, Torpedo Junction. Not a good nickname to have. Now, even though the Japanese and the Germans were, were allies in World War II, it was kind of a loose arrangement and the Germans had actually been taken by surprise by the invasion of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. And it was a good thing for us that they were because can you imagine if they had coordinated an attack on both coasts, what that would have done to us? But even, even though they were a bit surprised, they were quick to take advantage of the situation. So while the United States was focused on the war in the Pacific with Japan, Germany began sending U-boats across the Atlantic to attack supply ships, and especially oil tankers along the East Coast. It was a plan they called Operation Drumbeat. Now it took the subs about two weeks to make the journey um, across the Atlantic. Then once they were near our shore, they'd have enough fuel, supplies, and ammunition to attack ships for about two weeks before they had to turn around and go back home. So why were they doing this? Well, their goal was to disrupt our shipping lanes. And on this map here, you can see them uh, marked in blue lines. So we were bringing literally tons of oil, tons up north from South America, Texas, and the Dutch West Indies. And where did those lanes converge? Off the Eastern seaboard. And where could the U-boats get close into shore and still stay in deep water? Off North Carolina. It was perfect cover. So all those red and yellow dots that you see on this map, those are allied ships sunk by U-boats. A lot of them merchant ships, non-combat ships. So the Germans, their theory behind this was that if they could cut off that oil supply, then our factories would come to a halt, our military would shut down, 
and and the people our people would freeze to death and would, we would be forced to exit the war and of course we also wouldn't be able to bring any oil or supplies or men or anything over to england and they would be forced to surrender so when most people think about u-boats um, and submarines they think they're the same thing but there were some major differences u-boats were actually surface boats they were meant to travel on the surface they ran diesel engines on the surface and, and were pretty efficient. But when they went underwater, they were operating on battery power. Um, so they mainly used their, their ability to, to submerge as a way to hide from boats and planes or to avoid bad weather. Because once they were submerged, they were very slow. They could, and they could only travel about 60 miles. Um, and they could only stay submerged for a matter of hours before they ran out of oxygen and the pressure of the water began to crush the boat. So they preferred um, to be on the surface when they were attacking. And so they mostly would attack at night because then they um, could be under the, the cover of darkness and it would make it easier for them and harder for their, their targets to see them. But even with those limitations, experts have described German U-boats as among the most effective and seaworthy warships ever designed. So when the US entered the war, England, um, had already been fighting the Germans for several years. And so they gave us some advice on how to deal with the German U-boats. They said to have um, merchant ships should travel in convoys. They should travel in, in large groups together. That would make that a lone ship is, was a more vulnerable target. They said you should escort those convoys with military ships to help fight the U-boats. So again, they'd be less likely to be targeted. They said, stay away from normal shipping lanes because that's where the boats, the, the U-boats are going to hunt, is in the shipping lanes. That's where they expect to find the ships. And they said to black out the cities along the coast because when the ships were coming along the shore, when they were traveling along the shore, they would be silhouetted against those lights, making them easier targets for the U-boats. So the British gave us all this good advice based on their experience, and we did none of that, at least in the beginning. So there were several reasons that we didn't take that advice. Some of it was practical and some of it was political. Um, at the beginning of the war, remember, we were fighting over on the, in the Pacific. So the U.S., well, they didn't have the ships available to escort the military, the, the convoys. They were holding those military ships for surface battles or to fight in the Pacific. Um, now, they could have enforced blackouts along the, the seaboard. They could have ordered merchant ships to travel in convoys or to travel only during the day when they were less vulnerable. But instead, they only requested voluntary adherence to these guidelines. And I think, as we have seen in, in uh, recent events, so asking people voluntarily to do things, even if it's for the common good, a lot of times doesn't happen. So local towns along the coast didn't um, comply with the, the blackouts um, because they were worried about a loss of tourism. Um, and in the early days of the war, um, despite all the warnings from the British, it just seemed like the US government and the citizens didn't understand the threat that was there by the U-boats. And that put many ships and many lives at risk. So when you start looking at the numbers, it suddenly doesn't seem so surprising that a ship was torpedoed right offshore. These are the ships that were sunk by U-boats in January. So war started the first week of December. By January, there were U-boats in place and they were sinking all of these ships. Um, and then in February, there were this many. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear that you didn't know that there were that many submarine attacks in the Atlantic. I certainly didn't before I started researching this topic, but it's not our fault. Um, the US military and the US government authorities, they did their best to keep these attacks quiet. They didn't want people to panic. So news reports of enemy U-boats near the coast were classified and they were held back from the public for national security reasons. And so for many years, most people in the country had no idea how bad things really were. The news media agreed to the government censorship for the sake of the war, which helped to hide the military's inability to protect shipping and the lives of merchant seamen. 
This is the first half of March, and you can see that the John D. Gill is listed there with coordinates that are just offshore of Southport. Now, the Germans officially called this operation Drumbeat, but the German submariners had some other nicknames for it. They called it the Happy Time, the Golden Time, and the American Shooting Gallery, because basically they were able to destroy all these ships without any repercussions. So the situation finally began to change on April 1st, when the military restricted ships to traveling only during daylight hours between protected anchorages, which made it harder for the U-boats to attack. Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall said, the losses by submarines off our Atlantic seaboard and in the Caribbean now threaten our entire war effort. I am fearful that another month or two of this will so cripple our means of transport that we will be unable to bring sufficient men and planes to bear against the enemy in critical theaters to exercise a determining influence on the war. So it was that threatening, and yet most people didn't know what was going on. The campaign's impact on the supply chain constituted a greater strategic setback for the Allied war effort than did the defeat at Pearl Harbor. And in terms of US raw resources and materials, it was the costliest defeat of World War II. So that's the second half of April there. This is uh, the first half of May. Um, so on the, in the middle of May, May 14th, the first coastal convoy um, was sailed. It went from Hampton Roads in, um, to Key West and convoys later extended northward to, to Boston um, where they connected with British convoys that were being done by the Royal Canadian, Canadian Navy. So in April, they started traveling during the day. In May, mid-May, they started um, traveling in convoys. And then the use of um, full convoys provided an immediate reduction of Allied shrimping losses off the East Coast. And at the same time, the Germans also started losing their U-boats. So finally, there was some um, deterrent for them for doing this. And then by July, they, um, they were having so many losses and they were not having as many successes. So they withdrew their remaining U-boats and they came up with the different strategies to seek easier pickings elsewhere. But those first six months made a huge impact on the Allied war effort. In the first six months of 1942, U-boat attacks destroyed 22% of the tanker fleet and sank nearly 400 ships in the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. In American protected waters, not off someplace over there, in our own waters. They killed 5,000 seamen and passengers in the Atlantic, more than twice the number of people who perished at Pearl Harbor. And in the waters off North Carolina alone, more than 80 cargo ships were sunk and 1,600 lives were lost. So when you consider those numbers, um, it no longer seems so surprising that a ship was sunk off of Southport. So now we see that the John D. Gill was just one of many, many boats that were torpedoed in the waters off of North Carolina. But what exactly happened with the John D. Gill? Well, the Gill was out on, on only its second voyage. So it had first uh, come down um, from, Pen it was heading from Pennsylvania where the refinery was down to Texas where it had loaded up with a lot of crude oil. And then it was on its way um, back to, um, to Philadelphia when it was coming up the, up the, um, the East Coast. So um, on March 11th, uh, the day before the attack, the Gill put into Charleston because the Coast Guard had ordered it to stop there. They, they had planes that had seen a, a submarine tailing it and they said, they notified the ship and said, pull into Charleston uh, because we think you're in danger. And so they stayed overnight and the next afternoon about 12.45, um, they were given the all clear. They're like, it's fine. You can go continue on your way to Philadelphia. And so they headed off. Um, but the crew themselves were a bit uneasy. Um, on their first voyage down to Texas, they had actually um, encountered some um, men who were survivors from a, a torpedo attack. They had picked up 25 survivors on their ship. Uh, because their ship had been torpedoed. So they had these men on board, they were able to talk to them, they were able to hear their stories, they, they knew what had happened. And so they were very personally aware of the dangers that were lurking in the water. 
So the German U-boat 158 was, was on its first voyage. So the day before um, the attack in uh, Southport, it had sunk a ship. It was up at, um, in near Canada off of St. John's in Newfoundland. And it sunk, sank a ship there and then it moved down the East Coast. So this, this uh, submarine that I'm showing you there, that is the actual U-158, the submarine that sank the John Deagle. And this is the uh, captain of that ship, which I always think like if this was a Hollywood movie, if Hollywood was casting someone to be the, the captain of a Nazi U-boat, he just looks to me like he would be the one they would pick. Um, so two days later, um, the, um, or the next day, the, the, the boat had been up in Canada, they were heading down the East Coast, and then they got, they, they found themselves 20 miles offshore of Southport, and that's where they encountered the John D. Gill. Um, after they attacked the John D. Gill and sank it, they went on to sink one more ship, and then they damaged another one before heading back to Germany. So the torpedo from the German sub hit, sub hit the tanker John D. Gale amidships. It tore those heavy metal plates of the hull. It just split them like they were nothing more than flower petals. Um, the Gale was carrying over 140,000 barrels of West Texas crude oil. It had a very high gasoline co content. So when the torpedo struck the boat, um, there was a geyser of Texas crude that erupted from that hole, and it was forced out by the pressure of the, the millions of gallons behind it of, of oil. It just all came pouring out, and within a minute, this oil slick had formed on the water, and it started to surround the ship. An instant later, that same oil erupted into a big inferno, and the 58 men on board began a desperate scramble for their lives. Sadly, only 26 of them would make it. So this is Herbert Gardner. He was 22 years old in March of 1942. He worked on the John D. Gill as a wiper, which means he did general cleaning in the engine room and any other kind of tasks he was assigned. So that night, just a little before 10 o'clock, he was in the mess, he was having a cup of coffee and he was just wondering what he would do if the Gill was torpedoed. Well, 10 minutes later, he got his answer. He said, when it hit, it was like it picked the chair up and moved it out from under me. He said, we knew what had happened. But then, just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. Because you see, someone on deck threw a life preserver into that oil slick. And this life preserver was equipped with a self-igniting carbide flare. That flare was put there so that when a man was overboard at night, there'd be that flare, it would make him easier to see, be seen and be rescued. But when you threw that into that oil, the whole sea burst into flame. Mr. Gardner rushed to a lifeboat, but as he and several others tried to lower it, the boat suddenly dropped beneath them. Two of the men that were in the boat spilled into the water. Mr. Gardner and another man, uh, crewman managed to grab a line and they were just left dangling on the side of the ship, the burning ship. Below them, the ship's massive screws. So the big propeller that was moving the ship, those big screws were still churning. Um, Mr. Gardner watched as the two men that had been dumped into the water were then pulled into those blades. So he clung as tight as he could, and he and the other men tried to get a, a better grip on the line and onto each other. But the other man was just too weak to climb any further, and Mr. Gardner couldn't hold him, and suddenly he found himself alone, tethered to the hull of that burning ship. 52 years later, when he was talking about that, that ordeal, he said, that has bothered me all my life. So when the screws finally stopped turning, he dropped into the water next to the capsized lifeboat. One of the Filipino mess boys, Mr. Gardner thinks it was um, Ting, Catalino Tingzong, who they all called Benny. He was sitting in the half sunk lifeboat, soaked and frightened. He was scared so bad he didn't know what to do, Mr. Gardner said. I remember him just saying, no, no, no. Unable to help Tingzong and fearing for his own life, Mr. Gardner started to swim. Now he was wearing a cork life preserver, which buoyed him up, but he needed to get under those flames, under that water. So it was a really difficult struggle, but even wearing that life, cork life preserver, he managed with all of his might to dive beneath those flames and to swim. He said, when you're scared, you can do anything. 
but he had no way to tell where the sea was on fire and where it wasn't. He said, every time I'd come up, I'd come up on fire. My head and my hands would be on fire. Finally, he came up clear of the oil and was able to swim away from the ship. So it's important to remember that this was not a military ship that had been attacked. Like almost all the U-boat targets, this was a civilian ship going about its normal duties. And for the Germans, any merchant ship was considered fair game, but their top targets were large oil tankers like the John D. Gale. Now the ship, remember they didn't have ships to make convoys. So what the government did was they created this position called the, the Navy Armed Guard. So the ship had a military gun crew aboard. There were seven men known as, that were part of the Navy Armed Guard, and it was their job to protect the ship from enemy warships. Um, Seaman Floyd Reddy and Seaman Gary Potts were two of those men. They had been hard asleep when the torpedo hit. Now, Gary Potts said they slept in their, um, their clothes because they never knew what was gonna happen. So they kept their clothes and their shoes on because they never knew. And it was good that they did because they got thrown out of those bunks and they immediately scrambled to the stern to get to their gun. And you see a gun like what they had in the center picture. It was a five inch 51 caliber breech loader. All seven members of that gun crew made it to their post. Newspaper reports of the day said that the men stayed on their post for more than 15 minutes after the rest of the crew had abandoned ship. Mr. Potts said really wanted to at least get one shot off, but the sub could have come up outside the fire and we wouldn't have seen it anyway. The fire was too bright, but they stayed at their post squinting through that heat and the flames into the darkness, swinging the barrel of that big gun back and forth. And finally, with the flames inching closer, the surface of the ammunition box began to bubble. They knew it was heating up and it could explode. Mr. Reddy said, when that paint started blistering on that box, Hutchins, our officer said, let's get the hell out of here. So they left, their, they, but they found that their life raft was in flames. So the men had a burning ship behind them, they had a burning sea in front of them, and really no good choices. So what did they do? Well, they decided to jump into the, into the sea. Mr. Reddy said, we, we, did, we jumped right into the fire, we didn't have any choice. Now Mr. Potts, he didn't jump, he dove. He said, I used to dive off of railroad bridges, and I was thinking about the Navy telling me to jump feet first, but I said, the heck with the Navy, and I did what I thought best. So normally, jumping feet first is the safer way to jump, but it turned out that he was right, because had he jumped, he would have broken both of his legs. There was a capsized lifeboat just down below him. He couldn't see it, but if he had gone straight down, he would have hit it, he would have broken his legs, and he would not have been able to swim. Instead, he dove um, into the water, and his toes just clipped that um, lifeboat on its way down. Now, when the ship was hit, Edwin F. Cheney Jr., he was the ship's 24-year-old quartermaster. He managed to drop the raft at the edge of the burning oil and push it beyond the fire. Um, he managed, I'm sorry, he managed to push over a raft into the water. And then once he got it in, he dove in after, after it, got underneath it and began to push it. So he swam under the raft um, trying to stay away from the flames and managed to swim, pushing that raft through the flames and protect himself a little bit. He still got very burned, but he was able to bring this raft with him. And so eventually swimming this way, he managed to get beyond the flames. So he, when he did that, then he climbed up on the raft and he just was exhausted and he laid down just to recover. And then after just a minute or two of laying there, he realized that that wasn't enough. He couldn't just save his own life. He had to start trying to help the, the other men on the ship. And so he started calling out to the survivors that he could see in the water, directing them towards his boat. They could follow the sound of his voice. Um, and if, if they got close enough and they were too uh, weak to climb in, he would haul them on board onto the raft. And occasionally that night, twice, he actually left the raft, swam over to some men who were struggling so much they couldn't swim to it and, pull, and pulled them over to the raft and got them there. Um, so Mr. Reddy said, he helped us get aboard and he was pretty badly burned himself. His ears and his arms were burned. Most of the men had third degree burns on their heads and their arms. 
Mr. Gardner would later vomit for nearly two hours because his stomach was so full of seawater and oil. During the night, Mr. Cheney and Mr. Potts, and you know, I refer to him as Mr. Potts um, out of respect, but I do want to mention he was 17 years old at that time. He was a 17 year old boy in the Navy facing this, these hardships. Um, so during the night, Mr. Cheney and Mr. Potts pulled um, the, a Filipino cook from the water. And Mr. Potts said he was burned so bad, he was freezing to death. So he did a very kind thing. He, he gave that cook his life preserver. He took off his life preserver, put it on him to try to give him another layer to help him keep warm. And that small moment of kindness would actually cost Potts dearly later on. The men quickly realized um, as they were, they were all were gathered on the boat and they were kind of watching the ship burn. And then one of them went, hey, does the ship look closer to you? Does it look bigger? And after a minute, they realized it wasn't a figment of their imagination. The ship was bigger because they were actually being pulled closer to the ship by the heat of the flames. And they realized that if they didn't do something about it, they were going to get drawn back either into the flames and burned to death or they would be sucked under when the, when the gill finally uh, sank completely. So they quickly tried to figure out what they could do. They looked around the raft and they realized that there were some oars on the raft and so they would be able to paddle away. So that would be really useful, except they realized pretty soon that there were no oar locks. And so the, the paddles were, were useless, the oars were useless. There was nothing to paddle against. There was no, tra no way to get traction. So, as they were trying to figure out what to do, one of them figured out that if they bent over double, if they lay down and clung to that raft, and then someone stuck the oars against their stomachs and they clung really hard, and then the other men rode the oar, paddled the oars, they would be able to be work as human oar locks and they would be able to make traction. And so they decided to try it and they did, and they took turns rowing and they took turns being human oar locks and it worked. So very slowly, the raft started to pull free of that heat and they got a little bit further and a little bit further. And finally they got far enough out that they were safe. But even though the men had those cork life uh, preservers on to protect their stomachs, it wasn't enough. And the next day after they were rescued, they, they all had these big black bruises across their ab abdomens from where they had the paddles had rubbed against them. That is, they all did except for Mr. Potts because remember he had given up his life preserver to the freezing cook. So he didn't just have bruises, he actually had internal injuries from all of that paddle rubbing up against his stomach. But they did manage to make it safe enough far away from the boat. For the rest of the night, they just, they clung to the raft and they watched their ship die by inches. The fire was so bright and the smoke was so thick that the people on shore in Southport were able to watch it. They said, um, the men, Mr. Reddy said, it, it kept burning and burning and blowing up and blowing up until it finally just literally blew itself to pieces. And um, Mr. Potts said they watched the ammunition explode, explosion after explosion, and they realized that all had exploded, including the round that they had left in the gun that had been intended for the Germans. So Cheney, Gardner, Reddy, Potts, and the other seven men were on that raft all night long. They were picked up the next morning by the Coast Guard and taken to Southport. Now, the Coast Guard wasn't just waiting for daylight. The Coast Guard actually reached the ship by about 2 a.m., but it took them a while to search everywhere and to gather all the men up that they could and to do all of that. Um, so in the total time, um, it turned out they had spent nine hours in the water, and then two hours after they were um, sent back to Southport, the John D. Gill finally sank completely. Now there had been the life raft that we were talking about, and there was also one lifeboat that managed to escape. The men in that lifeboat were actually rescued by the SS Robert H. Colley, which was a sister ship to the Gill. It was another ship that was owned by the Atlantic uh, Refinery Company. And those men, were, that ship was on its way south to Texas. So they took the men in that lifeboat to Charleston uh, to drop them off for, uh, to, to be cared for. Uh, but then seven months later, the Collie was also sunk. 
So the 11 injured men and the 16 casualties were brought ashore to Southport. Uh, the casualties were laid on the ground at the waterfront next to what was Max Cafe, where Oliver's is today. So there's like where that parking lot is. Southport didn't have uh, an ambulance at that time and it only had one hearse. So a call went out for anyone um, who had a station wagon to come and help transport the wounded and the dead. Survivors were brought to Doster Memorial Hospital on Howe Street. Now this photo says Brunswick County Hospital because that was the original name of the hospital. Uh, but in 1939, the name had been changed to J. Arthur Doster Memorial Hospital. Josephine Hickman was a volunteer Red Cross nurse at Dosher Memorial when the survivors were brought in. She said, we didn't think even half of them hardly could live. They were so burned almost to a crisp and covered with oil. Some of them were burned so bad that the bandages were all over their heads. Only their mouths were open. You just fed them in between the bandages. The hospital staff worked 20 hours straight tending to the men. Now there were only, there was only one doctor, there were two doctors, but there was only one that was at the hospital. There were only five trained nurses. The rest, like Mrs. Hickman, were Red Cross volunteers. She said, we'd barely gotten our training when this tanker was torpedoed offshore. And here we were faced with this terrible tragedy, but we managed to save every one of them. And it's true, every man that came to Southport alive, left here alive, they all survived. These volunteer nurses like Ms. Hickman were, they were just Southport housewives who took a weekly six or eight week class once a week. It was taught by the, the wife of the local doctor, that, that doctor that was on staff there, Mr. Dr. Fergus, his wife, Mrs. Fergus uh, was a registered nurse and she had put this class together. And this was the first Red Cross first aid class that was taught in the state of North Carolina for World War II. So you think about it, she put it together within a few weeks of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and got everybody um, being trained. So Pearl Harbor happened December 7th. In a few weeks, she had that up and running. There were about 11 women that took it and they took their final exam on Tuesday night. Okay, that's when they showed up, they took their exam. They had Wednesday to be proud of themselves, to feel good, to wonder if maybe was it a waste of time, would they ever actually use it? You know, would it, maybe they could use it with their kids, um, but maybe they'd never have to put it to use. Next day, the next day is when the John D. Gill was attacked. Um, and they were suddenly in the thick of it. As, as Mrs. Uh, Hickman described, they were, they were very much involved in caring for these men. Burn victims are very nurse intensive um, kinds of injuries. And also, this was only three months into the war. They had no way of knowing how often this was gonna happen. They didn't know if this was their new normal. They didn't know if these attacks would continue and even get worse over the next weeks and months. So the 16 casualties were brought to the local funeral home on Moore Street, which some of you might recognize as the Christmas store. Um, sa sadly, seven men were never recovered. The Atlantic Refinery Company in Pennsylvania who employed the men helped to identify the bodies and return them to their families. And of course the Navy did the, the same for the four armed guards who, uh, who were killed. So JJ Laughlin was the hospital administrator for Dosher at that time. He had been on the job for three weeks when the attack happened. And I'm sure when he took that job, he never envisioned something like this being part of the job description. But he jumped in and he actually started carrying the dead to the funeral home. And he also enlisted the help of his son, Joe Sam Laughlin. Now, this picture that you see here was taken a few years later when Joe Sam was in the Navy. But on that day in 1942, when his dad asked him for help, he was just 14 years old, just helping his father with a gruesome but necessary task. Now, this is one of the men who perished in the U-boat attack. His name was Charles P. Kimball. He was 48 years old and he was from Michigan. He was the second mate on the John D. Gill. Now prior to that night, I think Kimball was probably feeling pretty fortunate because up until about a month before, he, uh, uh, before uh, this attack happened, he actually had been serving on another ship, the W.D. Anderson. Right after he transferred from the Anderson to the Gill, the Anderson was torpedoed and sunk off a coast of Florida, and only one man of that entire crew survived that attack. 
And that happened just a couple of weeks before the John D. Gill sank. So I kind of think for those couple of weeks, Mr. Kimball probably considered himself a pretty lucky man. So I received this clipping of Mr. Kimball from a relative of his, Ms. Vicki Jo Cooper. And after she sent it, I, I took a look at the obituary for him and um, it underscored to me how the military was able to keep the information about Nazi U-boats and enemy attacks to a minimum. So some of the, the articles in um, the Southport paper, Raleigh, Charlotte, they mentioned the U-boat attack because you really couldn't keep it a secret from people right here in North Carolina. They, they saw the men. But further inland, um, they didn't tell them about it. So the article for, um, about Mr. Kimball just said, um, his family had received a telegram from his employer, Atlanta Refinery, telling them that his ship had sunk, just like it says in this, the headline, victim of sinking. Um, they told him that his remains had been recovered and brought to Southport, North Carolina, and that they would be sending him home. And then the, uh, the newspaper said no other details were provided. So his family was left to wonder about what had caused the ship to sink and what exactly had happened to him. And because he was a civilian, he wasn't considered a casualty of war, a member of the military. They, his family didn't receive any military ben benefits, even though he was very obviously killed in an, an act of military aggression. So among the dead was another man named Catalina Tingzon. Um, he might've been the mess boy that Mr. Gardner had last seen sitting in the capsized lifeboat, um, but he was a mess, definitely a mess boy on the ship. Um, and most of the casualties just, just like the man I just mentioned, were returned to their families for burial. They were able to send them home by train. But Ting Zong was a Filipino. His country was under occupation by the Japanese because of the war. There was no way to send him home. So the people of Southport decided to bury him in Northwood Cemetery. Uh, the American Legion um, put together the funeral, paid for it. Several ministers worked together to deliver the ceremony. The American Legion acted as pallbearers. The Boy Scout troop came in uniform to pay their respects. And this picture that's here is one of the Boy Scouts that did attend. Um, his name is Franco Malachek, and he was um, 13 at the time. And according to the newspaper, the grave was just covered with flowers. So many people came and brought flowers and, and cared for them. Um, so, and then um, the other picture, um, Reverend uh, Brown, uh, was one of the ministers who assisted the funeral. So there were three ministers all together who performed the ceremony. Reverend Brown, who was a Baptist, Reverend Allgood, uh, who was Episcopalian, and Reverend Harrison, who I assume was Methodist. I haven't been able to confirm that, but it makes sense. Okay, on April 11th, 1943, because um, remember these were civilians, there was nothing that the government did for them, but in 1943, by a joint resolution of Congress, the Merchant Marine Distinctive Service Medal was authorized. So they created a medal and it was to be awarded in the name of the president. So the very first award was personally presented by FDR in October, so about a year and a half after this attack, to Edwin Cheney, the ship's quartermaster of the John D. Gill. And the citation read, he released and launched a life raft from a sinking and burning ship and maneuvered it through a pool of burning oil to clear water by swimming underwater, coming up only to breathe. Although he had incurred severe burns about the face and arms in this action, he then guided four of his shipmates to the raft and swam to and rescued two others who were injured and unable to help themselves. So, you may be wondering, well, what happened to the U-158, the U-boat that attacked the John D. Gill? Well, the captain and the crew returned home from their inaugural voyage to a hero's welcome. They had sunk three ships and damaged a fourth. A few weeks later, they went out on their second mission, and this time they sank nine more U.S. and Allied ships. But then, on June 30th, 1942, about three months after they sank the John D. Gill, uh, their luck ran out. While they were in the waters of Bermuda, they were spotted by a U.S. aircraft. Lieutenant Ari Schrader of Patrol Squadron 74 was flying a patrol bomber Mariner 600 miles east of Southport when he saw U-158 floating in the water. The sub was on the surface and there were men on top of the ship caught by surprise. They were still on the surface when the first depth charge was dropped. The plane swung around for another strike. 
This time, the charge hit the top of the sub as it was attempting to do an emergency dive. So it was a depth charge. The idea behind depth charges is they go into the water when they reach a certain depth, the pressure of the water will cause them to detonate. This one though, embedded itself in the splintered shell of the sub and uh, didn't detonate. So at first the, the, um, the plane crew was, was disappointed, but the sub, um, continued trying to do their emergency dive. Everyone was, was below, they were starting to dive, and when they dove, they took that shell, unexploded shell, with them. When they got to the designated depth, the charge detonated. So the plane circled the location for several hours. But there were no survivors. So I was able to find the actual report submitted by Schrader to the military command. Um, these are the actual drawings included in the report. So the drawings were optional. Um, but he included them and um, they really liked them because they commended him for including them and said they really added value to the report. So you can see, he, well, anyway, you can see he drew all of the, all the perspectives going into the, um, to the blast. So in March, 1994, 52 years after the sinking of the John D. Gill, the Southport Historical Society erected a monument dedicated to Catalino Tingzon and all the men of the John D. Gill. The gray granite stone sits on the lawn of Waterfront Park, overlooking the horizon where the tanker burned and, and sank while the people of Southport anxiously watched and waited to help. So this is a picture from the dedication ceremony in 1994. It was 52 years after the disaster, but amazingly three of the original crew members, Gary Potts, Floyd Reddy and Herbert Gardner traveled across country to attend. Later, Southport Historical Society received thank you notes from the men and their families for saving their lives and for making them feel like they had a second home in Southport. So here you can see pictures of them when they were uh, in 1942, and then you can see pictures of them 52 years later. Um, and here are Gary Potts' three children in, um, in 1999. So Robin Potts, Joyce Pollock, and Roger Potts um, are shown here and they were making a donation to the Maritime Museum in Southport. They gave them their father's uniform, a photo, his Bible, and his watch. And you can view those items at the Maritime Museum in the special exhibit on World War II and the sinking of the SS John D. Gill. And so here you can see his Bible being handled very carefully with um, protective gloves. And you can just kind of see um, in the, uh, front piece of the Bible where he's written, you can see pots and you can see US Navy. So um, that was his, his Bible that he carried with him. Um, they also have his uniform on display. And I, I just really encourage you to go see these items. And I think the uniform in particularly is poignant because it just shows that he, was, he wasn't very old. <laughs> he was 17, he was the youngest one on the entire ship. And um, it, really, it really brings home how, how vulnerable these men were. And so now that you are one of the few people who know the story of the sinking of the SS John D. Gale, we hope that you will join us next Saturday as we commemorate the 80th anniversary of the event. We will have um, exhibits about the attack, including two original artworks that were created by local Southport artists uh, commemorating the event. The Southport, um, the Brunswick Bellas from Southport, I can't say it, South Brunswick High School, uh, we'll sing the Merchant Marine songs and the National Anthem. Our guest speaker will be Tish Hatem, who will talk about her grandmother's experience as a nurse treating the men. That was Josephine Hickman that I spoke about earlier. After the ceremony, we're going to reconvene down by the memorial in Waterfront Park. Uh, we, we will be joined by the American Legion Color Guard. And members of the Oak Island Coast Guard will lay the wreath at the monument. The American Legion will play taps. Um, and the ceremony will close with a salute to fallen sailors by the, uh, the firing of the Southport Historical Society cannon. Um, we will also have flowers available for anyone who wants to take one out to the end of the pier um, to, to say your own private thank you or prayer before tossing the flower into the river. So I hope you'll be able to join us. That starts um, next Saturday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Uh, the, the program starts at 4 p.m. We will be opening the doors at 3.30 so that you can um, take a look at the exhibits. And now I'm going to stop sharing and uh, answer any questions and, and uh, make, see if we have any questions for Joyce Pollock or Tish Hayden. All right. Does anyone have any um, 
questions? Uh, okay, Linda, like the program, thank you. Anybody else have any, any questions, any comments? <clears throat> Anything from Tarabella? Yeah, we did. We had two questions, actually. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the first one, uh, when you hear the last name Potts, the first thing we think of is Joshua Potts. Uh -huh. Was there any relation to the man who kind of founded Southport and to the person on the ship? So Catherine Calmanson, who is um, Susie Carson's daughter, some of you know Susie Carson was the founder of the Southport Historical Society. She shared uh, Susie's notes from the time that time with me and some of her correspondence with Mr. Potts. And Susie tried very, very hard to prove that there was a connection between Mr. Potts and Joshua Potts. And she still was convinced that there was one and she just hadn't found it. And, you know, to be fair, that was in the 90s. They really didn't have the internet or ancestry and all these things. So I don't know if we looked again today, if we might be able to, to track it down or do a DNA test. <laughs> it, it, it seems like too much of a coincidence, but I appreciate her doing it. I don't know. Much. Joyce, what do you think? Do you think <clears throat> that your family is related to the founder of Southport? Oh, you're on mute. <clears throat> Joyce, can you unmute yourself? Hear me. There we go. Yeah. Um, I don't think there is a, a relationship there. I have not found it. Um, I had talked with Susie here in the 90s, and I was just starting in on uh, working on Ancestry at that time. But I don't think there is. My dad was from Iowa, and his family came out of Pennsylvania. And so I don't think so. <laughs> well, unfortunately, if there wasn't that um, that connection, there certainly was was a strong connection because yes, uh, yes. <laughs> and I'm sure Joshua Potts would have approved of the the way the people of Southport behaved and stepped up for that moment. Yes. Um, okay. And, oh, um, just a second. This is Tara, uh, Tara Ballad. Dave, did you did you say yeah, that we, we have one more? Miss okay. King was wondering what the population of Southport was at the time of the attack. Um, I want to say in the neighborhood of between a thousand and fifteen hundred people. Um, Bob, does that seem right to you? Yeah. So, a small small town, and it wasn't like now where there's three thousand people in Southport, and then there's you know six thousand people in St. James. That was it. There was you know. It was very isolated. That's that's if that's all the people there were. That's pretty much all the people that there were. Gotcha. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Okay, great. Um, Stan, what's what's your question? So um, I unfortunately I joined uh, a little late, but over what period of time were these tanker uh, sinkings uh, happening off the coast of North Carolina? The the majority of it was in the first six months of the war. So the, the United States got smarter, um, started putting things into, putting the ships into convoys, starting doing military escorts, um, and so, uh, and started enforcing things like blackouts and, and traveling during the day. So, but in, in six months, there quite a few, uh, I, think, I think it was twice as many um, were killed as were killed at Pearl Harbor. Over 1,600 people right off of North Carolina and 80 mm -hmm. ships were, um, sunk off the shore of North Carolina in that six month period. It's a lot. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Okay, Joyce, did, is, did, what did you think of the program? Now your father, just to remind everybody, your, her father was Gary Potts. He was the 17 year old young, just, I just about choke up every time I say it, youngest one on the ship. Um, did, what did you think? Did you did you was there, did you know the whole story? Well, my dad never really talked about it. Uh, just, just a minute. Do you want us to come back? No, that's okay. okay. Um, he didn't talk about it. We knew part of the story. We knew about the human Orlock part, but he really he didn't share much. Uh, he, he, in later years, in the 90s, he went to many of the uh, ship reunions because he had been on, he was on several other sh ships during the war. And so he, he did do that. Um, but your presentation was spot on. Oh, good. Okay, good. 
And that's that's a really good point about the other ships because that's the thing. You think you're in you're in this you're attacked by a torpedo. It seems like okay, game over. I've done my part. But these men had to go back out on other ships. Now um, Joyce's father was in the Navy, so they would have reassigned him to another ship. The Merchant Marines were civilians, so they had to volunteer for another ship. So it was volunteer. They had a certain amount of time before they had, to, when they would finish one ship, where they had to get back on another ship. They had to find a position on another ship, I suppose, or the same ship they were already on, um, if, if they hadn't gotten blown up. But um, if they waited too long, they were actually subject to the draft. So one of the men, well, I guess it was the one who, the three, the three men that I spoke about, one was not in the Navy. He went back home to recover. Um, and then by the time he was recovered and stuff, he'd been drafted. <laughs> but he was drafted into the Army and he said his wife was happy about that because she was not going to let him go out to sea again. So then he served out the rest of, uh, of the war in the Army. But these men went out on other ships. And Edwin Ch Cheney, the man that um, rescued his, his um, shipmates on the raft, he was, um, he went on another ship and within a month or two after that, he was torpedoed again and was in another uh, event, survived twice, but it, it wasn't like, okay, you went through this and now you're done with your war effort. Um, these men had to continue to go back. And I, I can't imagine how frightening that must have been when you had been through uh, a torpedoing and you knew it could happen to go back out there and, and do it again. Joyce, was your father ever um, in another shipwreck or was he okay? No, he, he was okay the rest of the time. He, he quit high school. He quit in his junior year so that he could uh, join the war effort. He uh, signed his mother's name and lied about his age. And I have his original card, ID card, and it said that he was 21 years old. <gasps> and he, he was seven. They knew. They knew. <laughs> I, I'm sure they no did. No way. They looked twenty. Yeah. Oh and I, one other little aside: the the picture that you showed where he's lying in bed. Mm -hmm. If you saw my younger brother, um, I I would have sworn they were two peas in a pod. They looked exactly alike wow. at that okay. at that time at about That's seventeen. Cool. Yeah, that is. That is amazing. And did he recover completely? You said you knew about the human orlocks. Is that because he had per permanent injuries or did he recover completely? No, he re he fully recovered. He, he had no burn uh, scarring or anything like that either. Oh, but wow. he, he attributes most of that because he dove off the ship instead of jumping off the ship. Yeah, yeah. One At one time when following orders was, was not the right thing to do. So that was good that he... Um, thought for himself. So uh, Tish, are you, you're on, can you, can you turn your mic on? Maybe your, your uh, camera if you're able to. I'm here. Great. Did you want to turn your camera on or do you want it off? I don't think I can get it to work. That's okay. okay. All right. So, um, so Tish, your grandmother took care of 17-year-old <laughs> Gary Potts and the other men um, that were injured. So uh, what kind of things did she, do you, do you remember anything that she told you um, about that? Well, they were all so sweet. She said they were so appreciative and it was such a new responsibility for these women. Um, but they took it, you know, they, they wanted to make sure that the men survived. So they did everything they could possibly do to care for him. That's wonderful. It's it's just hard to um, to imagine. And like I said, they had no idea um, what was going to happen. They didn't know if this was going to be happening every week. They didn't. Of course, they didn't know how the war was going to turn out. It must have been a very frightening time for everybody. And. Um, so many people in Southport just stepped up to help. Tish is going to be our, um, our speaker uh, a week from tomorrow and is going to be talking more about um, her grandmother and, and the events of that time. So um, I hope you're all able to, to come and hear that at the community building. Um, Liz, um, yes. I know that uh, Tom, Tom Milner, who's, who's still on, he had some 
had some questions. Tom, do you want to you want to ask those those questions that you posted? Oh, oh, did he post them? To, I'm sorry. To the yeah. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I was curious. I looked at that uh, graveyard of the Atlantic, which is a listing of all the, a book about all of the boats that were sunk along the east coast, mm -hmm. along the coast of North Carolina uh, through recorded history. And it turns out that the Gill is the fourth boat that was sunk in the first three months where they list the location as the Cape Fear River. Oh. And I was curious if Southport had implemented a blackout by the time the Gill was sunk uh, or if they were still providing that, that background. That's the first question. Do you know? Yeah, well, I think that they were blacking out. They definitely implemented a blackout eventually. Um, I don't think, they weren't like a big city. It wasn't like New York City, you know, some of the bigger cities. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Stuart Kalari, who was seven at the time. She recalls blackouts. She recalls people having the dark curtains, um, you know, keeping the lights, you know, away from the windows. She recalls people painting their um, headlights so that only a small portion of, of the light would show kind of pointed down. So she remembers all those things and sad that they, um, that Southport did have blackout. She was seven. So I don't know exactly when, like if they did it that early or if they did it after the, um, you know, after this happened, but if Southport definitely did. I also just don't know how much light pollution Southport could have been producing at that time. So the, was, two, the two Coast Guard boats that went out, the Tug and the Cutter, Mm -hmm. Were they based on Oak Island? And was mm -hmm. the Oak Island Lighthouse active at that time, or did we stop using the lighthouses during the war? Yeah, see, that was some of the controversy, because even uh, during the Civil War, they knew enough to turn off the light, the lighthouse. So I think it took a while for them to turn the lighthouse off. It was probably controversial, um, because it could also cause wrecks. Um, but I don't think they turned it off that early. I do know, back to the lights question, in December, so it ha the Pearl Harbor happened in December, and they were already... Um, arguing about lights that early on because there was a question of should we put up the Christmas lights? We have these annual Christmas lights and some people um, felt that we shouldn't put up the Christmas lights because they weren't really worried about submarine attacks. Their argument was about air attacks. They were very concerned there was going to be a bombing and that the, 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 the lights would show and that an airplane might bomb them. I don't know why, but that was what they were worried about. And then other people said, you know what, the chances of an air attack is not very high and it's more important to improve people's morale. So they didn't end up putting up the Christmas lights. But they definitely, and they had civil defense meetings starting almost immediately after Pearl Harbor. So at some point they did do the blackouts. I just haven't found anything in the paper yet that where they're announcing now you must have a, you know, you must black out. But I'm continuing to look. Liz, mm -hmm. am I off mute? Um, I will add to the story on Saturday. My father who's 89 was nine years old at the time right. and yes they did have the blackout at the time so stay tuned for okay the next good program and you'll hear lots more okay good well and my apologies to Stuart. maybe she remembered correctly when she was seven i just took a seven-year-old yes. recollection of the grain of salt but there you go she is a reliable narrator <laughs> she is she is um any does anybody else have um Questions, comments? Did, was that all? Was, oh, go ahead. Hi, my, my name is Bill Gross. Hi, my Bill. dad was in the Merchant Marines near the end of the war. Uh -huh. He was on a ship exactly like that one. But what I wanted to comment was that the Marine, Merchant Marines were never ever recognized as a branch of the military, right. along with the Navy and the Marines and Army and so forth. It wasn't until 1980 that they finally got recognition. And at that point, my dad was able to be buried in a national cemetery on Cape Cod up in Massachusetts because of that. Um, so, I mean, they never get the benefits, they never got recognized. And even today, they never um, recognized as part of the military branches. When you go to, like down in um, uh, Ocean Isle, or wherever that place is where they have the memorial for, um, they're the only place I know of that has a merchant marine plaque Wow. And nobody else, uh, if you go anywhere else, you always see the flags of even down at the North Carolina battleship, they don't have a merchant marine flag down there at all, even though they're oh, wow. finally recognized now as a merchant marine, as mm -hmm. a branch of the military. So, yeah, um, I've always felt that it was kind of a kick in the you know, head because 
they lost more men than the Navy did because of all these ships that were sunk. And they, the, the war would have been lost if it wasn't for the merchant marines because they brought all the military uh, weapons and ammunition over to Europe and Japan or wherever out in the Pacific. And they were the backbone of the, of the war, but they never got recognized for it, so. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The more merchant marines, you had a higher uh, chance of dying with merchant marines. I think one in 26 men in, in the merchant right. marines died. Yeah. Um, higher than any other branch of the service. And like MacArthur said in that, um, I think it was MacArthur, whoever said it in, in the quote, um, yeah. you know, if without them, they were going to lose the war. This was, they needed right. what, what the merchant marines were doing, and mm -hmm. yet they weren't given the same um, um, respect. I will say Lori Sanderlin at the um, Maritime Museum, I guess, I think in their gift shop, maybe, don't quote me, but they give a discount uh, to members uh, to veterans, and that includes merchant marines. And sometimes right. the, they have merchant marines come in, and they go, "Oh, ma'am, I'm not." And they were like, "Yes, you're you're a veteran." But right. the men, they didn't have benefits if they were their, their families didn't receive benefits. They didn't have benefits if they. Um, and then after the war, they didn't. They weren't able to take advantage of the GI Bill. You know, any of those the the VA loans, they they didn't count for any of those um, things, even though they were critical to the the war effort. Right. So. Um, the other, the other thing we have is we have a, a, a couple comments on the uh, on our chat chat line. Um, I just want to read a, a couple of them. Uh, Linda Picana says that was great, Liz. Thank you, uh, Desi. Well, I, I, it's an email address. So Banana Video says thank you, Liz. I learned a lot and salute all of your all for their bravery, uh, Janet said this is fantastic i learned a lot and i'm looking forward to next next saturday Yay. eve says to everyone thank you very interesting and there's another one one more here and that's from carolyn evans who says amazing presentation all the crew were so so brave and, and if that's the carolyn evans i think it is uh that's quite an uh quite a tribute to you that Carolyn would say amazing presentation. <laughs> well, whoever, whichever Carolyn it is, I'm sure it is, but thank you um, very much. Um, I don't know if, if that's, he, what he's referring to is our performer last week, if you saw the um, Black History Symposium was Carolyn Evans who did um, Miss uh, uh, Emmett Till's mother in, and that is that recording is out there. It was an incredible, incredible performance. So if you get a chance, um, be sure and, and watch that performance. Mary, um, Mary Ellen and uh, Frank Newton are both on Facebook, and they also sent their sent their compliments. Oh, uh, good. As, as as do I. It was a fantastic <laughs> job. Thank you. It's such an amazing story. I'm so happy to be able to share it, uh, Joyce. I'm so happy that you were able to um, to call in, and I'm I'm glad that you feel like we 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 gave your dad's story justice, um, and I hope that you can share the recording with your brothers. I, I hope so too. And I appreciate the fact that you scheduled it around my schedule. I did. That's why we're meeting on Friday because I really wanted Joyce to be able to attend and I knew that was a good day for her. So thank you everybody for being, being flexible. And um, if there aren't any more questions, so I just want to mention uh, next Tuesday, we're having our second Tuesday talk of the month. It'll be um, Alexis Gore. Her family goes back in Southport for generations since before the Civil War. She's going to be talking about um, uh, education, black education following the Civil War. She'll be talking about uh, Jean's teachers. Um, uh, Anna Jean's was a, a Quaker um, millionaire philanthropist who contributed and also talking about her, her aunt Miriam Gore, who was one of the Jean's supervisors. So that will be a very interesting presentation. And then next Saturday, we're having our um, in-person meeting. <laughs> this will be the first in-person indoor meeting that we have done, program that we have done since before COVID. And um, there's limited seating, but we're gonna be in the, the community building. We will have exhibits that you can look at. We will have, as I said, we'll have singing, we'll have uh, speeches and then afterwards. And if you don't feel comfortable being inside or you get uh, shut out because there's not enough uh, room, join us at the uh, waterfront for a very moving wreath laying ceremony. And we're gonna have the cannon fired. And like I said, we'll have flowers you can take out and have a private moment out on the pier if you would like. So please do join us, that's all free. And we would be, um, we'd be thrilled to see all of you. 
So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>